Hello, speakers. So, just I'm recording the sound, so I have the video. Um, I did this uh, as a keynote at DDD Melbourne a few days ago. However, I didn't want that to be recorded because I shared some very personal stories and I wasn't prepared for uh, the session to be recorded. So I'm recording it this time around, uh, leaving out some of the stories that weren't really mine to share, if it makes sense. Talking about being burned out is a very personal thing and a very difficult thing to talk about as well because it's one of those things, if you could call it a disease, it's you can't really show that you're bleeding anywhere. You can't show that anything is broken. It's kind of all in your head and all in your heart and all in your stomach. So it's one of those things that's very difficult to talk about because unless somebody else has experienced it firsthand, they don't know how it feels like and they can't relate. Even if they've had somebody in their family uh, or a friend who's been through the same thing, you don't know until you've actually been through it yourself. And also, it's the way it's experienced is so different from person to person. This session is very much about my own experience and it does differ from person to person, but I hope there might be some key points that maybe helps people think about this a little bit more and that they can relate and hopefully you know, start a conversation around this. Because I know when I was going through this, I had nobody to talk to. There was nobody that talked about this. And also, coming uh, from Romania, having a background where I grew up poor and being in a country of distress, quite similar to what Ukraine is going through now, I always felt like I was, in a way, being really spoiled, allowing myself to have these insignificant problems when I should just be thankful that I now was in a good situation and then I, you know, I had family, I had my health, I had, you know, everything going for me, and there I was being burned out. Ooh, poor me. It made it difficult for me, and it took a while for me to realize uh, that I really should pay attention to what was happening. I used to live in Australia a few years ago. Um, it's funny though when time passes, and when you, I hate this when it happens. You talk to people, you go, like, I used to live in Australia. And they look at you and they ask, oh, when? And you start calculating, and it's almost a decade, you know? It makes you feel really old. I'm staying at the backpackers, and I was uh, talking to some of the teenagers there, and they were asking me, oh, when were you here last time? And I was like, eight years ago. And they go like, well, that doesn't count, because it was eight, eight years ago. I came here eight years ago because of this. <laughs> And I was drawing this on the airplane. I had two elderly gentlemen sitting next to me, one on each side. And they kept looking all over on my surface. And, I, and at some one point, he's like, I've got to ask you, are you drawing the prime minister? <laughs> well, I haven't had the pleasure of seeing him half naked. But I did a Google search, and now I've had. Um, I was not drawing the Prime Minister. I had this vision of coming to uh, Australia and seeing this really good-looking, tanned uh, uh, lifeguards, you know, and I'll be drowning, and that saved me, and stuff like that. <laughs> but I was met by some, I was met by a skinny little Greek hairy guy, and I ended up dating him for half an hour. <laughs> Just not, not my thing, really. It was very much for me, I had these grand dreams about moving to Australia because I was always looking for the next big thing. And that pretty much describes my whole life. I'm always looking for the next big thing. I just want to experience as much as possible. I am resilient. I am Teflon. Things just peel off. If it becomes difficult, it's like frying in a Teflon pan, a really good one. Jamie Oliver one, you know, it just <laughs> slides right off. So what could possibly ever happen to me? I'm just not the type of person. I'm always happy, always cheerful. I don't have problems, and certainly not mental ones, right? But the thing is, with, with this image here, like when you have expectations and you have dreams, that means that you also set. You set your expectations, and when they aren't met, that's when difficulties first actually start. One of the things that I did in Australia was take on scuba diving. You have the standard backpacker things to do. You take a picture with a koala. You take a picture feeding a joey. You take a picture getting your ass kicked by a kangaroo because you think they're friendly in the middle of the night, driving in the, on the highway up in the mountains, and probably forgetting car insurance and hitting one or two. So you have the standard things you do. And uh, for me, scuba diving was definitely one of them. And it became for me a really big passion. And not too long ago, I did my rescue diver course, and I did it in, uh, where was it, in Thailand. 
And I remember that my instructor told me that there's no such thing as a scuba diving accident, which I then questioned, what do you mean? And he said, well, all accidents can be traced back to a single first really bad decision, and then kind of the ripple effect, something like this. And that's actually quite true. And for me, I think the ripple effect wasn't so much moving to Australia. It was me starting to set up expectations, not about a lifeguard. <laughs> that turned out, that's, that's a whole different story. So I'll tell the ladies separately about that. <laughs> but it did start with me having some dreams that I really didn't understand what the consequences would be uh, if I failed to live up to those dreams or if they actually happened. So it started off with a single bad decision. And for me, the first bad decision was to start studying something I didn't like, and I certainly really wasn't qualified to do. I started studying nutrition. For me, it seemed like the perfect thing to do. I like to work out, I'm fit, I'm a personal trainer. I was at the time also uh, side working as a fitness model. And for me, it just made sense. I'll get into nutrition. When expectations um, don't really line up with reality and what you're going to do, that is one of the actually main indicators that you might run a risk at being burned out. They've done a lot of studies, and in particularly with people working in the medical field. Most of the studies have been done there, because that is, that's where you see a lot of incidents of people being burned out. In particularly, doctors that have this idea of what they're going to do usually involves saving lives and doing all these awesome things, and they might end up you know, having their dreams crushed because they basically sit in an office, fill out papers for most of the time, and you see the same thing in academia. So when you have dreams, and then what you end up doing doesn't line up, it's really difficult for your system to handle, it's difficult for your brain to kind of comprehend and kind of realize it and actually just, just go with it. And that's what happened to me later. I thought that when I was going to work as a nutritionist, which later turned to be a clinical dietitian, that I was going to be saving life. I would be, you know, people would come to me, I would tell them things they've never heard before, eat your vegetables, you know, like, <laughs> took me four years to learn that. <laughs> that's a, that's a quite expensive lesson now. So I had these dreams of rescuing people. People would come to me and I would do all these magical things, I would be, you know, people would respect me, I would be a person of authority, I would be important, I would save people's lives. That's what I wanted to do. Not so much because I wanted to save people's lives, I just liked the idea of kind of being a savior. It's more for like selfish reasons, uh, honestly. But it's not how it ended up for me. For me, instead, I was constantly battling people who everybody thought they knew better than I did. And in many cases, they probably did, because nutrition is very personal. And it's not very often it's actually about the nutrients. A lot of times, it's about underlying factors. And since I'm not qualified to give people any advice in terms of psychology, there wasn't so much I could do. So every single day at work would just be the same thing uh, over and over again, this constant battle. And it didn't really line up very well with what I expected that the end outcome of my really long education would be and my also financial investment in that. But even as I was studying, I knew that I was studying the wrong thing. I didn't... It was... It was fun learning new things, it always is, but I wasn't as excited and I wasn't as passionate as I need to be. There's the thing, people are quite different. Some people are happy just, you know, kind of just floating along, doing their thing, and that's what they like. Some people have an immense need of being very passionate about what they do. Uh, I'm going to stop this. Some people have an immense need of being very, very passionate about what they do. And you shouldn't compare yourself to other people. You really have to go by... This one is really annoying. Yes, still it's recording. You have to go by what's important for you and how you work. So if you have a big need to be very passionate about what you're doing, you're not going to be able to be happy doing one thing that another person are happy doing. And that's the problem when you ask people for advice, when you're in a situation when you're not happy. People will tell you to be happy based on their own needs of what they uh, call ha uh, being happy. It's not based on your own needs. Nobody can really tell you what you should be content with. Nobody can tell you, well, you should be happy because you're healthy, you have a good family and you're doing well off. 
If you're not happy, you're not happy. Nobody else can convince you otherwise unless you really feel it. So I didn't like what I was studying, but I kept going because I couldn't see a way out. First of all, I had the scholarship, which would be turned into a loan if I didn't fulfill um, the requirements, which was basically was to have pass grades on everything. So I continued uh, going it, and I ended up getting really, really burned out. And when people ask me how it feels like to be burned out, things stopped working. Oh, there we go. It feels something like this. It doesn't, it doesn't happen suddenly. It's not like you wake up one day and it's like, oh, shit, I'm burned out. It doesn't happen like that. Uh, it happens really, really slowly. It's kind of like you're in a cave and you can just see that above you, it's just closing in. It gets darker and darker and your dreams of kind of escaping or getting out of it, uh, feeling alive, just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And it happens very, very gradually for a lot of people. For some people, it is sudden. But for the majority of people, it happens very gradually. And people around you will probably notice before you do. And they will start commenting on you changing. The first thing that usually happens is that you start working harder. Because if things aren't working out, it must be because you're not working hard enough. We do have this motion, in particular, uh, this was, I think, more during the 90s and around 2000, that everything was about being a hard worker. You had all these videos, all these movies about, you know, the main character working really hard and partying really hard as well, but mostly working really, really hard all the time. And also, this also became uh, also the image for women, that, you know, you were the businesswoman. You should juggle, you know, 15 kids, working full time, having, you know, cooking at home and just doing absolutely everything. And it was all this pressure of just working really hard. So it's kind of inside our brain that if things aren't working out, I am not working hard enough. That must be the, the answer to it. You start working harder. You start ignoring other people. It's kind of a side effect of working harder, but it's also something your mind kind of does to kind of protect yourself, kind of scope yourself around work. You start spending less time with your friends and your family. You start becoming more irritated, and people will comment on that. They will tell you that you've, you've changed. Uh, and for me, this was something really difficult uh, to share with other people, and I haven't talked about it much before, but for me, this meant that uh, my, my ex-husband, which at the time was my husband, so you can kind of understand where I'm going with this, it really affected our relationship as well. Because from being a really strong, confident woman, which he met and what he really liked about me, I was turning into a person who was working really hard, working 24-7. I was constantly irritated. I didn't have time for him. He was just annoying. I was just annoyed at people calling me, trying to talk to me. I just didn't want to have people around me. And it, it happened really gradually, but people were trying to tell this to me, and I would just brush it off and thinking that it was inside their head because I had to be working harder if I was ever to get to a point where I was happy. Cognitive function declines as well when you're, when you're burned out. You get worse at multitasking. We're pretty shit at multitasking anyway. Usually we're good at task switching, which means switching between tasks, but we're not, humans aren't good at multitasking. It's a myth. Our brain doesn't work like that. Our brain is pretty much single-threaded. But at the same time, what happened to me is that I was getting worse at uh, task switching and my cognitive function really declined. I would start messing up things. I would forget to reply to an email and it's been a month or I'd forget to send attached files. I forget to set up equipment properly. I have problems communicating with my clients and tiny little things like that. So I was starting performing worse at work. And what you do then is, of course, you work even harder. And if your boss brings you in to have a conversation, now I had my own company, so I didn't have that. But I would have you know, some of my students kind of make some comments that they were unhappy with some of the things that I did. It just made things even worse. And I would just close up even more and just kind of shut people out even more. I was just literally just slowly sinking, uh, feeling like I had a rope around my neck. And it's really a very suffocating feeling that it's very difficult to explain. Because you can see yourself kind of slipping away from reality, and you're also realizing that it's really, it feels like it's outside of 
what you can do to save yourself and you're just hoping that somebody would just kind of dive in the water and just cut that rope off and let you can get back to the surface which rarely happens so you're just sinking it was quite difficult I've been talking about some of the stages um, that have been recognized in terms of uh, being burned out and I've had all these stats and graphs and things like that because I, I did a nice review. I've reviewed over 20,000 articles for this session. But I decided that, you know, we people, we're not really good at remembering facts unless it's like a really, really fun fact, like uh, why we say God bless you when you sneeze and just things like that that doesn't really add tremendous value. But real facts like this, they don't really stick around that well because it's not how, how our mind works. We do, however, like stories a lot. So I was hoping that by telling a story, you'll remember the story and somehow I can sneak in some facts there. But these are the, the stages. So usually it starts off with a really compulsion to prove yourself. You can't really say you're already burned out there eh? because I think most people, in particular if you're a high achiever, you want to pr prove yourself. But even if you are not a high achiever, you still kind of want to prove yourself, right? Because you want people to like you. Then you start working harder. And that's kind of where you can you start to tell that there are going to be problems ahead. You start neglecting your own needs. You start neglecting other people's needs. And then you start changing your values. Before, you feel like family is number one, you know. Um, I remember this with my parents as well. I remember the, there was a point where family was number one. And I also remember there was a point where let's just survive was number one. So values also change. The point where I would start worrying in terms of colleagues, because, because it's really hard to notice it yourself. You've got to try to see if it's happening to people around you. I would say in particularly when you start seeing number six and seven here, denial, denial of emerging problems and also withdrawal. Withdrawal is very, very rarely a good sign. We as human beings, we're social by nature. It's not very natural for us to start withdrawing. And in particular, you should contrast this to how the person used to be, how you used to be. If there is an abrupt change in your personality, there, it's a good reason to start thinking about what is actually happening. There was a really interesting uh, study I read about human beings spending time with themselves. I don't remember this 100%, um, but I think the study was something like this. So we put a person in a room by themselves for 15 minutes, and they had nothing to do. Sounds kind of horrible. And they had absolutely nothing to do, and they had to rate how much they enjoyed spending time with themselves. They were not allowed to listen to music, no fiddling with a phone or a laptop or anything like that. And most people didn't like it. Then they were asked, so we have this button here. Let's say it's like here. And if you push it, you'll get uh, an electric shock. Would you pay for that instead of spending time with yourself? People would actually pay to press the button and get a mild shock instead of just spending time with themselves. And they would still have the rest of the minutes there. Okay. And then, you know, they didn't charge people because I don't think they actually could do that because of the study. But they left the button in there. And I don't remember if it was half, but the majority of the people ended up pushing the button. So you might think, okay, it's curiosity. I've always wanted to kind of get electrocuted under a safe environment, you know? Like, I've seen people attach things to the nipples, so I might try. I, I've never tried, I've never seen it, I have no idea where that came from. So, <laughs> just saying, okay? Sweets are weird, but not that weird. There are things we do not sell at IKEA. One person pushed the button, not once, not twice, not three times, but 180 times during 15 minutes. I mean, you could probably say that he must be burned somehow uh, after all of that, but I think it goes to prove that we've got issues spending time with ourselves. Uh, we need the stimulation from other people. So when a person withdraws, and even uh, particularly if it's for a longer period of time, you know, it's not like five minutes in the bathroom because they need a good cry, then you, you should definitely talk to that person. If it's you, you should talk to somebody else and talk about you. Then you have the behavioral changes, depersonalization, uh, which also goes again to behavioral changes when you kind of take a step away from yourself. An inner, inner emptiness, this is difficult for other people to see, but it's something you sense. 
this is what I call the I am not suicidal, but I kind of like not to wake up in the morning. Uh, it's, it's a weird feeling of you don't want to end your life, but you don't feel like living. And it might sound like those, I'm just saying, you know, this, the same thing, but it is a, quite a big difference there. You don't want to go through the motion of actually dying, and you would like to exist at some point in time, but right then and there you see no purpose of waking up in the morning. And that's what happened to me. One day I came home, and I remember this day really, really clearly. I came home, I was in absolute tears, I'd been crying a lot. My husband was sick and tired of seeing me crying. It was at this point that every time I cried, he would just leave the apartment, because he didn't want to deal with it. It became a kind of poisonous uh, atmosphere between us. I came home, I pulled the curtains shut, I went to bed, and I didn't get up for months. I would only get up if I really had to go to the bathroom. I hardly ate. I lost a lot of weight. And I, I just, I, I couldn't stop crying. And I just, I didn't want to get up. I didn't feel like doing anything. And of course, uh, that meant that my whole business basically went to hell uh, because of that. Because I just, I couldn't manage. Even the simplest things, such as <laughs> taking a shower or uh, doing laundry, or just like simple things that you usually can do almost in your sleep, I just couldn't do the simplest thing. So depression, I was not depressed because I did go see a doctor and I've, since I, I have uh, adult ADHD, uh, so I've been in therapy since I was 14 years old because I can't take any medication because it doesn't work well with my body. So I've done cognitive behavioral therapy my whole life, so I always see a psychologist uh, and I've, you know, they did a new evaluation. I wasn't depressed, that's the thing, like not that everybody develops a depression and some people, they don't even, they don't seem sad, they just seem really upset and almost aggressive. And this step doesn't always exist there. And then the last step, you know, is when you're basically burned out. But it's not like it has to happen like this. It's kind of fluid and it all kind of melts together. But these are definitely uh, warning signs to look for and also should give us an idea where to start working on things. For me, getting out of being burned out was uh, really an uphill climb. Uh, I didn't even know where to start. Like, People say, well, you know, it's uphill for here, it's like climbing a mountain. I even, didn't even know which mountain to look for because I'd set my life on becoming a clinical dietitian and that was what I was going to do. So I really had no idea where do I go from here, what do I do, what's the next step for me. I, I had no idea. One day, uh, where I'm, I had managed to get out of bed, um, I was uh, going to the grocery store because uh, my at the time husband was working, so I had to kind of feed myself. And I was biking through the, the graveyard. Uh, behind the house we lived in was a beautiful graveyard, uh, which is really old. It's uh, one of the most known in, in Sweden. I don't remember the name, but it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's really beautiful there. And you have these really old stones. And it says on each stone, it says the name of a person. And then it says, you know, beloved something and something. And then if it's really, really old, it doesn't even say that. It just says what they worked with. <laughs> And I remember that it, I, I stopped and it just struck me that are we only what we do? Am I just my job? Am I just a failed dietitian? Um, and that was for me actually the kind of the revelation which kind of made me rethink what I was doing and me deciding on doing a massive career change and start learning something completely new, programming. I didn't even have a real computer at the time. I knew nothing about computers and first week in school I didn't even know how to set up the Wi-Fi and uh, oh god, horror, I couldn't check my Facebook for a week. Um, yeah, <laughs> Facebook, yeah, lol. Uh, <laughs> That was what changed it for me. It might seem a bit random. The, the story behind how I came to that conclusion is it's a different story. I'm happy to share another time, but it's not the main point of this, uh, this session. So I decided on doing a drastic change. For me, it was really important to have something that felt like a somewhat controlled, but still a drastic change. I really didn't... I, I, come to the point where I hated what I had been doing so much and I had only bad memories related to that, that there was no way for me that I would even consider going back to that. So it was important for me to have something completely new to work on. 
and so started my uphill climb. So when we talk about factors, things that, that influence you when you're burned out, and when you start kind of recovering or building your way up from that, you still have to keep those factors in mind. And those factors are you know, largely divided into two groups, which is external and also internal factors. On the external factors are job demands. Uh, in, where you have really high uh, job demands, and also if they're really, really low, in either of the extremes, uh, you increase the likelihood of having people that are burned out. For me, I had a very, very uh, a job that really required a lot for me, that was really difficult, and I was working very, very long hours just to make ends meet, and I never quite felt like it was enough. And that was one of the things that contributed. So for me, when I decided on stepping into a, a new job, I, I decided quite early on that I was not going to let that happen again. And although I love programming and I do it 24-7, I don't do it because work tells me to. I've never worked in a place and never ever will I work in a place where it's required for me that I work 24-7 or that I work uh, beyond what I'm paid for or beyond my comfort zone. Because in the long end, nobody wins on that. Nobody ever wins on that. Because... I'm not sure if you've seen the studies where they look at how much time is spent and how much you actually get done, you know. There is a limit. At some point, the more time you put in, you're not going to get more out on the other end. It doesn't work like that. Having low control, and that was a problem for me as well. I had no control over uh, my own career or what was happening at the time with that particular job. And I always felt like when I moved to programming, I had more control. If I wanted to specialize in an area, I could. If I wanted to work with something specific, I could. I could actually take control, and that was important for me. I changed my attitude toward job a lot. I became more committed, and putting my own satis satisfaction in front of other people's needs became really important. I say other people's, I was thinking like employer and clients, because at the end of the day, if I was happy with what I was doing, I would do a good job and therefore everybody else would be happy. If you think the other way around, uh, it's not going to work long term. You're going to run high risk of actually getting burned out. Having variety in work was extremely important for me. I told you about how every single day was the exact same thing, the exact same battle. So for me, changing to a job where I actually could change things up and I could do different things and you know, keep, keep my mind guessing uh, without it ending up in being too high you know, on the demands there, it really helped me keep my passion. Even, even now when I've been doing this for a little while, I'm still just as excited, if not more, uh, working as a programmer. Lack of recognition, uh, feeling unappreciated, that's something we all really, really hate. And in, in certain jobs, it's really hard to feel appreciated because you don't really have that direct connection uh, with, with the end result that you're doing and the person that gets that end result. So I actually try to be more involved now uh, with the clients that will end up using our systems because if I am involved and they get to see me, I can also know where I can fix things, but I also get a little bit of recognition and I feel like what I'm doing is actually adding value and that makes it a bit easier for me to get to work. And also, having no room for you. Um, I'm very happy to see that we're moving away more from just, you know, being assembly line workers, where you go in and you work, and work is an interruption of your day, you know, you do all these awesome things and boo, you go to work, and then once you're done and you have your paycheck, you can finally go do the things you like. I see more and more now that work is a continuation of your personal life and not an interruption. Work is just another part of the day when you spend time with other people that you like and you get to do things that you like and you happen to get a paycheck. But it's not more like, I can't wait for my work day to end. If you're thinking that every single day or the majority of the time, it might be worth for you to reconsider if you're doing the right thing or if you should discuss with your boss if there's anything else you can do within the company. You know, we're all going to have ha uh, days that we hate and we have that even at home, days where you don't want to go home, you know, you've had a fight with your spouse or whatever or you just, you just don't want to deal with the kids because you're tired. But if it becomes more the, the common scenario than the exception, 
then there is definitely something you need to reconsider. You also have the internal ones, and the external and the internal factors, they, they really do overlap. Uh, the internal ones is, you know, just having enthusiasm for the job and what you're doing, and that goes along with your personal attitude, and that, all, that those align really well with your personal skills. Not being or not feeling qualified for the job that you're doing adds tremendous stress. If you feel like you're an imposter, like, why did they even hire me? I have no idea what I'm doing. There is this thing called imposter syndrome where we feel like, oh my God, if people found out that I actually have no idea what I'm doing, I'm totally going to be fired. It's, uh, it's just little mind tricks our mind plays on us. Um, and usually, not always, but usually it's completely fake. And you do actually, either you know, actually nobody knows what they're doing, so you're at the same level. Um, so that's where it's actually at. But we do have this thing called imposter syndrome, where we, a lot of people constantly feel, the, in particular, the, the better they get at the job, they start learning all the things they do not know. And as that world expands and you realize that, oh shit, I thought I knew everything, but I don't know that and that and that and that and that. And it seems like everybody around you is just bragging about what they know. So you feel like you don't know anything and you're an imposter and you shouldn't be there. But you can't really tell your boss because you still got to pay your rent. If you feel like you don't have the skills that you need for the job, it's something to discuss with your line manager or whoever is in charge. But I would take into consideration there is something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, and we see this a lot in school, is that if you don't know what you don't know, you think you know it all, you know? This is the thing. I, I, I see this clicker, and I only see this clicker. It's kind of like the, the black swan analogy if somebody's read the black swan. You see this clicker and go like, there's only one clicker in the world. I know all the clickers in the world. It's here in my hand. I'll tell people, this is how a clicker works. We should use this clicker. There's only one clicker, you know, and you're like utterly convinced of that. But if one day somebody presents to you another clicker, you go like, oh, I thought... I thought there was only one. Some people go in denial. Well, that's not really a clicker. That's like, that's a remote control. This is a clicker, you know? And you start defending it. But you see more and more clickers, and you realize, like, so at one point in time, I thought there was only one. Turns out there are several. Therefore, next time when I see a table, if I make the assumption there is only one table, the likelihood is quite big there are more, ta uh, more tables. And therefore, that means I don't know anything because I don't know what I don't know. It's a really overwhelming feeling. In school, those are the students that are utterly convinced that there is only one clicker and they've seen them all, or seen the only one that exists. Those students are the hardest, hardest ones to teach because they will just not take any information. So feeling a little bit like an imposter is probably a, a good sign that you're sane but just don't let it pull you, self, uh, pull you down. And if there are places where you need to improve and things you need to learn, you go do that. But don't feel like you can't add value. It's a sign of sanity uh, to start questioning yourself and how much you know. That's good that you come to another level of knowledge. So I decided as I was starting to uh, learn programming is that I, I'm going to find my own way. I know a lot of people, like the majority of people in my class, you know, they, a lot of them just wanted to learn enough to get a job. I did vocational training and that is the purpose of that education is to learn enough to get a job and then you go code monkey. So code monkey is an expression we use for just, just writing code and you're happy with it. It's a great job. I love programming and just writing code is fine. But I just knew that within me, I just, I, I just got to have world domination. It just boils down to that. I just want to have, you know, world domination. And I just can't settle for less. I can't settle for that just, you know, eight to five job. It's not me. I'm not saying everybody has to be like that. I hope not, because then competition will be a bit big. I hope everybody is convinced that's the best way to go, and then I can just go off kind of doing my own thing. So when everybody was kind of happy on top of that mountain, because everybody had a little bit of a climb, not just me, I decided I'm going to take a look over the edge and see what's there. And I found my passion. It's a big bright fire and I found my passion. And I decided to go for it.
<laughs> now, the thing is about being passionate and being a high achiever and being opportunistic is that it turns out that is one of the, the characteristics of uh, personality traits of people that more easily get burned out and people who have a high level of anxiety, which also kind of works with that. That, 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 would, that would describe me. So per science today, I am more likely to get burned out. And there are actually personality traits that can indicate if you're likely to get burned out. And some of the personality traits are um, being quite anxious, uh, worrying a lot, uh, people telling you that you overthink things, and I, I get that a lot. Usually you end up coming up with really good solutions because you are overthinking and you're looking beyond the simple solutions. But it also means that you're adding a lot of pressure on yourself and you're probably a little bit of a perfectionist. I know everybody says that they're a perfectionist, but some people truly, truly are. The people that don't go home at the end of the day because they're just not happy with something they did. So. You have to look out for, for yourself and think about your personality traits. And if you are a go-getter person that wants to go 100 miles an hour all the time and you want to do this, you want to do that, and when people work slow, you get a little bit annoyed, oh, I'll do it, I'll fix it, and you, you volunteer to do absolutely everything because you love doing it, or you just get annoyed when other people do it. You are one of those people that are running a high risk. It doesn't mean that you should change that. It just means that you should monitor yourself a little bit more and you know, sometimes put the brakes on and let other people slow you down and put the brakes on for you. Find somebody that you can trust and tell them, you know, pull me back now and then because I'm going to need it because I got no self-control pretty much. When you're very, very passionate, you also run the risk of, you know, you're looking over the edge and you're seeing the fire and you're passionate about it, but you're also running the risk of, you know, falling over the edge and kind of ending back there again. A lot of people that get burned out once, they get it again and it kind of, it becomes almost a little bit easier uh, getting back into that state of mind because it's like your mind remembers it and kind of wants to go back in a really, really weird way. And recovering from a burnout can actually, for some people, take up to 10, 12, 15 years. For some, half a year. And how long it takes, you can't really say. But it's, uh, it has been compared to post-traumatic stress. And it is actually just as serious. So if you are really passionate about something, it doesn't mean that you're safe. You know, like, I'm passionate, I'm happy, I'm resilient, I'm Teflon, I'm going to slide off like a Jan Jamie Oliver cooking pan, you know. No, you're still running the risk. And you might actually be running it higher than the person next to you who's, like, more than happy, five to five, just go home and just do the thing. And, you know, they don't even care that they went home on what we call a broken build, you know. Uh, something got messed up. You're like, no, nah, it's fine, it's work, I'll deal with it on Monday. It doesn't mean that you are running a lower risk, a risk than that person. You're probably most likely running a high risk than that person. So you've got to think about that. What I've learned from, from this journey and going through all of this was in particularly that I need other people. I, I started pushing people away from, from me. Uh, it's not the main reason for why why me and my husband end up getting divorced. It was just pretty much about time. Uh, but it did probably contribute to uh, poisonous times that we didn't need to have. I did lose a lot of friends during that time because I didn't let people in. And there, you know, at some point, some people just give up on trying to reach in and talking to you. And if you don't open up and don't talk to people, they don't, they don't understand, they don't see it. And they, they see an image of a, a person that is misbehaving and treating them bad. And that adds pressure on them. And you have no idea what other people are going through. So they will, you know, slowly pull away. So I did lose some friends. And I didn't try so hard to find new friends either because I didn't want people to have to deal with my shit because I knew, like, everybody has their own shit to deal with. Why should they have to deal with mine? What I, however, managed somehow to still make some friends, it wasn't planned, it just happened. We just kind of fell in friend love. And these were actually fellow students at my school. And I have one of them that during times when I've had it difficult, uh, because 
talking about finding your passion, I, I wanted so hard to find my dream job that I quit a good, well-paid job that I really liked, going for my dream job, which was in the US, and I couldn't get a visa, and suddenly I was without a job, unable to pay for my apartment, and going through a divorce. And I had nobody in my life, because I got so used to just managing on my own. It was a really difficult time. And I was at the point where I didn't want to answer the phone. I was like sliding back into this, this, this ocean, with kind of a rope around my neck. And there was only one person I would pick up when he was calling, only one friend. I'd see his face on my phone, you know, Skype, and I would only answer. If my mom called, I wouldn't answer. I would just turn the sound off. And my sister, I wouldn't answer. Anybody else, but I saw him, I would answer. And I don't know why. I've opened up to people that I didn't know. Somehow I felt it more comfort, uh, comforting talking to people that didn't know me because they would just listen and not try to fix things immediately. Because they didn't know me, they couldn't provide any fixes. They would just listen. I just needed somebody to be there for me. And this person in particular was just a person that would feed me. <laughs> he liked cooking and he would convince me to come visit him. In his, uh, he lived a bit away from me, but he would kind of convince me to come visit him so he could cook for me and practice his newfound recipes and so on. And that, that helped me tremendously. And I realized that I did have friends and I had to reach out. And the biggest reach out for me was the community. I'm completely overwhelmed by the fantastic response I've had from the community sharing this story. And also when I shared a story about my situation with you, you know, uh, going for my dream job and then ending up uh, basically not having a job. And when I wanted to apply for a job again, I didn't want to settle for anything. I don't want to just pay my bills. I'm so freaking spoiled I can get away with actually aiming for a job that I love doing and just feels like a continuation of my day and not an interruption. So I went publicly out and I said, I am looking for a fantastic job and you guys and girls got to help me. And the response was absolutely overwhelming. And I'm also surprised how many companies are able to offer that. Uh, made me really hopeful for the future. It turns out that people I don't know, people I've never met in my life, and I, they just read a simple 140 characters tweet, they still want to reach out and they still want to be there for you. And I have no idea what it is inside us human beings that does that, why, why we want to do that. But it's freaking amazing. But it does mean that you need to send that first tweet, you need to, you need to reach out, you need to signal that first help. <laughs> And you'd be amazed how many people will actually respond to that. And all in all, you know, with all the advice you can give on being burned out, avoiding it, or making sure, you know, it doesn't happen so often, or how to rehabilitate from it and all those things, it all boils down to most important thing is, is to have people around you. And it doesn't mean that you have to have the love of your life or a fantastic family or a big bunch of friends. It can be complete strangers. Probably you need a little bit of everything because you're never, never, ever going to know exactly what you're going to need when you get there, if you get there. And looking at the statistics, we're all, you know, running a quite high risk. Things are changing. There is so much we need to know now, and things are changing so fast. We aren't coping so well with it. I mean, we've been doing things a certain way, and things are just escalating at such a fast pace. And you have, you know, the millennials, you have Generation X, you have the people coming in that just seem, they're just born with freaking iPads and stuff. They just know how to do things so much faster, and it adds a lot of pressure on us. So while the world is spinning 100,000 miles an hour, you just need somebody to slow things down and just have a decent conversation. And it, you don't know who that's going to be. It can be pretty much anybody, but you've got to make sure that you expose yourself to other people and that you allow some more transparency. There are some idiots out there in the world, that, but do I dare say that the vast majority, 90-something percent, are actually really, really good people that actually care. And we do have something inside us where we, we would rather love somebody uh, else and provide more help to another person than we do to ourselves. It's an easier way for us to do something good to the world because it's hard to fix yourself. It's easier to try helping other people. 
So with that, for me, the, the outlook seems pretty good. I think I've learned a lot of good lessons. I am in no regard safe. I uh, did, however, find my dream job, and I'm moving to UK. And I jokingly said that out of all the requirements I had for a good job, I forgot to put down must not be a tiny town in the UK. And uh, I'm moving to UK, starting up with a new company, and I'm really excited about that. And... Uh, feel rehabilitated and I don't really see myself being burned out anytime soon but you never know and if it happens when it happens I feel very confident that I have people around me that will look out for the signs and the symptoms and by sharing this today hopefully I've added more people to that list <laughs> and that's my only goal you know so I guess I'm not saving the world, but if I can save a person for five minutes, that's, that's good enough for me. And uh, it's a bit cheaper than doing a four-year medical education. So, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>